Welcome to this video on histamine and the respective drugs antihistamine. In this lecture, we're going to essentially look at how histamine is a chemical mediator for inflammation, but specifically for allergies, and what drugs, antihistamines, can be used to mitigate the effect that histamines has on the body. Okay, so histamine, we're going to work in the context of inflammation. Inflammation is a process where there's most likely tissue injury, and the body wants to take away whatever caused the injury and repair the tissue. So inflammation has to go through a few steps. It needs to dilate a blood vessel to bring blood to the area. It needs to make the blood vessel a bit more leaky to allow things to go out of the blood into the tissue. And it needs to bring immune cells to the area to help clean up the area and heal the area. But how does this process, all these processes occur? Well, we need mediators. We need chemical mediators. Now, the first one, the most apparent first mediator that happens in inflammation is histamine. So histamine is very important to understand. Now, we would probably classify this as a paracrine hormone or a paracrine chemical mediator, which means it gets released from cells into the local tissue. It doesn't usually go everywhere like, say, insulin does for, as a hormone, but it can, to some extent, in a more serious form of inflammation or an allergy. So let's start off by thinking about where would you find cells that release this? Well, it's a type of immune system. So we want to look at the body in its most vulnerable parts to um, the outside world. So this is where we'd have the cells located that would release histamine. So we'd have it in the nasal cavity, in the mouth, around the eyes, in the respiratory tract, because technically this is also the outside world. I haven't drawn it, but the gastrointestinal tract would also have a lot of cells for histamine and of course the skin. So the cells that hold on, store histamine, are mast cells, basophils, eosinophils, and platelets. But the number one is the mast cell. And so I'm going to focus now predominantly on the mast cell. So here's a mast cell. I'll just draw a mast cell. A nice, happy mast cell. So mast cells, where are they located? Well, they're located in connective tissue. Okay, right next to blood vessels. That's where they're going to be located. They're a type of immune cell that is made in the bone marrow and then they move out and then they move out of the blood and they go to this tissue where they're going to sit around and wait for f certain physical trauma or certain allergens or certain things to come along so they can release their histamine to induce an uh, inflammatory reaction. So we would see them in connected tissue. right next to blood vessels. So where would you find them? Well, you'll find them just under the skin, under the epidermis. So a good location is skin. You would find them in mucosa. So mucosa is very important. So where's mucosa? Well, you have it around the eyes, you have it in the nasal cavity, you have it in the mouth, you have it in the airways, you have it going down into the bronchioles. You have it in the gut, you have it in the esophagus. So and I think I said skin. So this is the location where you would have these mast cells just sitting around. Now, how do they get histamine? Well, they convert an amino acid called a histidine or called histidine. They convert it through an enzyme and they fill themselves with this histamine, which is called a granule or granules. So when the mast cells, I'll just write it here, mast cells, when they release their histamines, it's because they're in granules, it's called degranulation. Now, what causes the release of this histamine? Well, we could say physical trauma. So this would just be injury. That would be one. Number two would be temperature. So a really cold temperature can cause histamine to be released. And if that's in your airway, you can kind of get a, like an asthmatic response. Um, this is the most important one, allergens. And we'll come back to that in a second. And then sometimes certain immune proteins like complement proteins like C3A, C5A can also in induce a mast cell degranulation. But we're going to focus on allergens because today is really about allergies, the role of histamine with allergies and then the antihistamine drugs. So allergies, how do you get allergic to something? All right, let's just give an example. Some people are allergic to pollen. Pollen is just something that comes from, say, flowers or trees. It's, it's innocuous. It shouldn't cause any problem to your body. But for some people, it does. So I'm going to just use it as a P. So 
P comes into your body. Normally, for a lot of people, this doesn't cause a problem. It's not going to be like reacting to a bacteria or a virus, but for some people it does. So what happens is the pee comes, you breathe it in, comes into your airway, and your body, for some reason, most likely a genetic predisposition, it sees this as foreign. So what it does is immune cell will probably grab it, swallow it, um, try to phagocytose it, and then it presents it to an immune cell. The immune cell will then come across, have a look at it, and say, okay, this looks a bit dodgy. We'll do something about this. So it then goes, activates a B cell. A B cell comes along, and the B cell, so the B cell will come along, Here's a B cell, and the B cell will say, I'm going to make antibodies against this pollen, okay? So it starts spewing out heaps of antibodies, and these antibodies looks like the letter Y upside down, but what they are, they lock on nicely to the P or the pollen, okay? Now, these antibodies go and then lock on to mast cells. So now the mast cell has all these antibodies against pollen, attached to it, all the mast cells throughout your whole body, in the connective tissue and blood vessels, in skin, mucosa, respiratory tract, nose, eyes, gut, everywhere, against pollen. So this mast cell is now sensitized, which means if it encounters this pollen again, it's going to do what? It's gonna degranulate, which means it releases its histamine, okay? And what is, where does that mean it goes? Well, depending where the pollen is, and where this mast cell meets the pollen is where we get the release of histamine. So if it's in your respiratory tract, we're gonna get the release of histamine, and we spoke about what does histamine do? It's a mediator for inflammation. So what are you gonna get? If you breathe the pollen in your airway, anywhere where that pollen's essentially gone, you're gonna get inflammation. And I'm gonna explain that now in a second. So now we have the mast cell, it's met the pollen, and remember, this is not just the pollen, it could be anything that you could be allergic to. So it could be peanuts. It could be gluten, it could be, let's say, cat hair, anything that, seafood, anything that people can potentially be uh, allergic to, the same mechanism occurs. Okay, so it releases its histamine into the local environment. Let's say the pollen comes in, we'll just call it, we'll say it stays in your nasal cavity at this point. So it releases its histamine into that local area. What happens now? Well, it needs a receptor. So we need a histamine receptor. Okay, now there are four types of histamine receptors, very well named, H1, H2, H3, H4. We're just gonna focus on H1. That's all we're gonna focus on today, H1. H1, most important for allergy. H2, more important for gastrointestinal changes. And the other three and four, we're not gonna focus on at all. So H1 is the one we're gonna look at. Where are these H1 receptors? Okay, well, smooth muscle will have H1 receptors. Blood vessels will have H1 receptors. Skin will have H1 receptors. Nerves will have H1 receptors. And the brain inside the brain up here will have H1 receptors. So what happens to smooth muscle when histamine binds to the H1 receptor in smooth muscle? Well, if it's the smooth muscle in your bronchioles, it will constrict, which means harder to get air into the lungs. So bronchoconstriction, it's gonna be difficult to breathe. If it's in your gut, it will cause the muscles in your gut to contract, and that's gonna cause pain probably, maybe diarrhea, cramping. Okay, blood vessels, what is it gonna to do to blood vessels? Well, it will cause them to dilate, which is what happens in inflammation, and it makes it leaky, increased permeability. So that means more blood to the area, more fluid out of the blood. So in that area, we get edema. In the skin, it causes the skin to get an effect called a wheel, which is like a blister bump, kind of like a mosquito bite, and a flare, which is the redness around it. That's a typical allergic reaction to an allergy of the skin. Nerves, it causes sensitization of pain nerves, which means increased pain, increased itch. Brain, normally histamine in the brain would cause you to be more wakeful, okay? So in the brain, you become more wakeful. Not so much from allergies, but just normally you'd have this chemical in your brain, so it causes an increased wakefulness. So based on the mast cell releasing in histamine, binding to the receptor in these different locations, 
you're now going to see the typical allergic response. So if the pollen is down here in your nose, let's say nose, mouth, airways, degranulation, out it goes because it's in the mucosa. <clears throat> Which one of these are here? Well, we've got smooth muscle, so we're going to start to get problems with breathing maybe. We're going to get dilation of blood vessels. The nerves will get irritated. So what do we get? We get lacrimation, which means the eyes start running. We get a runny nose. That is essentially the blood vessels becoming leaky. So all the nose starts running because it, the edema starts to occur. Okay, sneezing because we have irritation and it causes a reflex response to try and get rid of it. That's the sneezing. Red eyes, that's the red, the, the blood vessels dilating. More blood, eyes go red. Itchy, you want to rub your nose all the time. That's because the nerves are sensitized, particularly with their itch receptor. Okay, so this is a typical allergic reaction. Now, that could happen on your skin. So if you encountered, let's say, the same allergen, but if I was to inject that allergen just under your skin, and this is how we do allergy tests, you would put injections of a whole lot of things that you are typically going to be allergic to, and then you would wait and what you would see at the skin, you would see the wheel and the flare, which is the bump and the redness. And that will tell you you're allergic to it. Okay. And so that's going to happen out here in the skin. But we've really just looked at a typical allergic reaction. Now, what if it's really, really, really serious? So we know that sometimes people have a very bad reaction to peanuts. The same thing, <clears throat> but it goes beyond the normality. It just doesn't just stay with a bit of annoying allergy, it goes serious. So all the mast cells start to degranulate. So let's say the person eats peanuts, goes down the airways, sorry, not the airway, down the mouth, esophagus, down in the stomach, all the mast cells are degranulating into the, into the stomach and now we get a huge amount of histamine release, degranulation, and what do we see? Well, all the blood vessels in the body start to dilate they all start to become leaky. So that means fluid, because all the blood vessels have gotten bigger, blood pressure, blood pressure drops. So we get a huge drop in blood pressure. All the fluid goes out of the blood into the tissue. Also that causes more blood pressure to drop, but the airways start to close in because we get that smooth muscle constriction. So bronchoconstriction, your airways start to get in to close off so that means no air is getting down and the person's going to start to have a problem. At the same time, they're going to get changes in their skin so their eyes are going red, their lips start swelling up, they might get uticaria which means um, rashes on their, on their skin and this is what we call anaphylaxis. So this is the most severe end of allergies. This would warrant immediate emergency attention. Now the treatment for that is usually going to be uh, adrenaline or an EpiPen because we need to get the bronchioles open quickly and we need to constrict all those blood vessels and that's what adrenaline does. But we can also use some antihistamines. So for the last little while, we're going to just focus on the antihistamine drugs and just see how they're slightly different. Okay, so moving now to the antihistamine. So how are we essentially going to target histamine release and its effect in the body specifically against allergies, which we saw the side effects here. The side effects being hay fever, most predominantly, and nuticaria, which is essentially rashes. So with the, the creation of antihistamines, the early drugs, which they now refer to as first generation, so antihistamines is generally going to be broken into first generation and second generation drugs. The first generation were the first produced ones. And what they were, very lipid soluble, which means they can disperse many, in many places of the body, particularly they can go across the blood brain barrier. So they can go into the brain. Now, one drawback of that, we, if you remember, what, where the H1, is, what H1 receptor is located is in the brain. And what did it cause? Wakefulness. So if you block that, a side effect, commonly what you'll see in the first generation drugs, is sedation. It makes the person drowsy. Okay? Now, I've just put up some common first generation drugs here. So we have chlorphenamine. And this drug, H. U, so for hay fever and uticaria, but it's also used in the emergency setting. So when we looked at the anaphylaxis, this drug might also be useful in severe allergic reactions. 
Another common drug that you might have heard of is promethazine. Now, this is sometimes known as phenergan in a brand term, and that can sometimes be used for its sedational properties. So sometimes antihistamines, because they will affect across the blood-brain barrier, they can be used for insomnia or cases to try and put help people with sleeping. <clears throat> this can be sometimes used in children with certain cough medications or certain uh, medications where you're trying to get rid of the allergy but also help them sleep. Now, because, again, the first generation aren't super selective, they can act on other receptors in the body, most notably in the muscarinic. So this is the parasympathetic nervous system. So they can be also used for nausea and vomiting and also motion sickness. So these drugs can be also used for secondary actions like nausea and vomiting, etc. But because we're binding to muscarinic receptors, we can have a more side effect profile with the first generation. So we can get blurred vision because of its effect probably to the pupil and to the accommodation reflex. It's going to dry and cause a dry mouth. And it could also cause other effects to the gastrointestinal system, like maybe constipation or urinary retention. So this led to the second generation drugs, which are much more specific, probably less lipid soluble. So they're less likely to cross into the brain. So you're not going to getting at the, the drowsiness like the first generation. So these would be probably considered um, non-drowsy antihistamines. Some common examples are sertazine and loratanine. And these, again, highly used for hay fever and rashes. And remember, this is not only going to be used systemically, so you don't have to only just take a tablet. You can also use drops nasal sprays, which hopefully work in a more localized region and you get less side effects. So there we have it. Hopefully you've now seen how histamine works in inflammation, but specifically in allergies. And what are the common antihistamine drugs that can help mitigate this effect and hopefully, hopefully reduce the debilitating effects that allergies can have on people?